Okay. Well, thank you so much for attending. My name is Dennis Meany. I am the executive assistant here at ALBA. Uh, you're joining us for the Spain World War II and the Holocaust um, roundtable discussion uh, that will be um, that is part of the Perry Rosenstein Cultural Series. Um, just as a note to everybody, uh, again, you will have a chance to ask questions of the panelists at the end of the session. Um, this video is being recorded and will be shared on our YouTube page. Um, so if you do not want your face to appear, uh, please, uh, you, you, can, you can shut off your video. And if you don't feel comfortable asking a question, you don't have to. Um, so thank you again. Um, again, uh, uh, just for the, I'm pretty sure many people here do know, but ALBA is a educational nonprofit dedicated to preserving the legacy of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade and the International Brigades and the anti-fascist history of the United States. Um, this is this workshop is part of the Perry Rosenstein Cultural Series, named in honor of philanthropist and visit, visionary Perry Rosenstein, uh, whose Puffin Foundation has made so many ALBA programs possible. So this is a part of that series and we're very grateful for the Puffin Foundation for their support. Um, without any further ado, I will introduce our panelists. Um, Gina Herman is an associate professor of Romance Languages affiliated with Judaic Studies at the University of Oregon and also an ALBA board member. Uh, Sarah Brennis is a professor of Spanish and affiliated fac faculty in European studies and film and media studies at Amherst College. Uh, Robert Cole is a professor of Hispanic studies and the chair of the Department of Foreign Languages at the University of Rouen in Normandy and also an ALBA board member. And Joshua Good is an associate professor in the Department of History and Cultural Studies and director of the Museum Studies Program at Claremont Graduate University. Uh, thank you all for coming, and I will turn now turn it over to um, ALBA board member and Professor Gina Herman. Greetings, everyone. I really appreciate seeing this fantastic turnout. Um, Sarah Brennis and I, uh, some years ago, uh, sat together at a training at Northwestern University at the Holocaust Education Foundation where we envisioned uh, this volume about Spain, the Second World War and the Holocaust. And uh, the book was a, a major uh, labor of love, putting together the research of um, specialists in various fields across um, the globe. And our grand book tour was uh, cut short by the pandemic. So it's delightful to be able to present our uh, some of the, the aspects of research um, that are featured in this uh, large volume um, with you today. Um, I'm going to pass the microphone over to Sarah, who's going to begin the introduction to the volume. And then um, I will take over from there, uh, discussing a little bit more about the uh, shape of the volume and its goals. And then we will move on to a discussion of uh, four of the chapters in the volume. Sarah and I will each be discussing our respective chapters about Spaniards who were uh, deported to Nazi concentration camps. Um, Josh Good uh, will be discussing the theme of um, Nazis who fled and led a good life in Spain uh, after World War II. And Bob will be discussing um, the history of Spanish Republicans who participated in the French resistance and the liberation of Paris. And on to you, Sarah. Okay, Dennis, do you mind putting up that first slide? Absolutely. So, as we're putting up the slide here of the book, just to give you a little bit of background, our volume is a collection of studies that opens up the landscape of what's known about Spain and its relation to the Second World War, Nazi persecution of its enemies and the Shoah, the genocide of European Jewry. And perhaps the signal challenge that we encountered in the development of the book was how to go about establishing a logic through which our contributors could really analyze the history and the representation. First of Spain's roles during World War II, second of how Nazi terror impacted Spaniards directly, and third of how the, impl the implication of the Franco regime in Nazi affairs 
from issues of shared economic culture and trade um, to Spain's inconsistent position with regard to the plight of jewelry, European jewelry to be specific. So in the historiography of the Holocaust, there's a consensus that the Second World War and the Holocaust are connected and that they must be studied through their overlap. In this regard, we take as our point of departure for the case of Spain, this affirmation that's also made by Holocaust historians, Gerard Weinberg and Doris Bergen, who argue that the Holocaust is inseparable from the military conflict of World War II. We and our contributors uh, emphasize the justification and necessity of combining in a single volume topics which scholars working on Spain usually kept separate. For example, uh, the Republican deportation to Nazi camps and the Spanish participation in the French resistance, as well as Francoist policies towards Sephardic Jews, not to mention Spanish lone wolf diplomats who were enjoined to save Jews in Greece, Hungary, France, and other locales where, where the Spanish had legations. The myth of Franco looms large as savior of Jewish refugees and the purported neutrality of Spain during World War II and its diplomatic policies toward Nazis during and after the war. So we worked really with great care and sensitivity to be certain that the volume would not approximate some kind of random assortment of themes, um, but that in particular, the, the collection would address the history and memory of various victim groups and that we would not conflate necessarily those victim groups. Dennis, can you go to the next slide? So from the, ter the table of contents in our volume, you can see that we had to cover a great deal of ground. First, you'll note that the variety of disciplines represented in the volume among our authors include sociologists, historians, literary studies, cinema, scholars of Jewish culture, and scholars of Spanish anti-Semitism. The volume is divided into nine different sections, beginning with a prologue by the, the Israeli historian Chaim Avni, who is really the grandfather and pioneer of the study of Spain during the Nazi era. The first full section of the book deals with the legacy of anti-Semitism um, on the peninsula, on the Iberian Peninsula. And the second section um, then includes six chapters that are dedicated to the destiny of Jewish communities, the few hundred that lived in, in uh, World War II Spain, uh, collectives of Jews in North Africa, the history of escape routes through the Catalan Pyrenees that Jews traversed to escape persecution, Sephardic Jews in the camp of Bergen-Belsen, and finally the history of dozens of Spanish diplomats in foreign service who putting their own lives at risk and operating independently of any directives uh, received from Franco helped save the lives of some 8,000 Jews who would have otherwise been victims of deportation and Nazi extermination. The third part of the volume deals with the history of Spanish exiles in France, while the fourth section follows the history of those exiles to Nazi concentration camps, including Mauthausen, Buchenwald, Neuengamme, and Ravensbrück. Next slide. The fifth section of the book addresses the theme of propaganda from various vantage points, uh, the relationship between fascism and the Catholic Church, uh, the promotion of Spanish culture in Nazi Germany, and the anti-Semitic propaganda of the Franco regime itself. The second section moves on, the sixth, sorry, the sixth section moves on to explore the Blue Div Division, which was uh, a group of 47,000 volunteers and conscripted men and women who fought as part of the German army on the Soviet front. After 1945, Franco allowed hundreds of Nazi refugees from Germany to make a rather comfortable life uh, for themselves in post-war Spain. And the volume contains two chapters on the subject in the seventh section. The eighth section of the volume turns to a collection of essays about how the Holocaust has been represented in Spanish and Ladino novels, poetry, and theater. And the book finally closes with an epilogue by Alex Baer and Nathan Schneider about the Shoah as both event and metaphor that transfers its meaning to the crimes and human rights abuses of the Franco era. Gina, I'll turn it over to you. 
Thank you, Sarah. I'm seeing in the chat that folks are asking for um, a more readable image of the table of contents, which we will be happy to email to all participants. Uh, okay, so um, I'll talk now a little bit about um, the reason why Sarah and I felt very strongly that the volume should be interdisciplinary. And we wanted to bring together an international group of uh, esteemed scholars um, framed who, who understood the reason why we wanted to frame the work through the optic of both history and representation. Um, so in this way, we followed the vision of an important Spanish philosopher named Reyes Mate, and he has written extensively on the Holocaust, and he has asserted that with respect to the Shoah, with respect to the Holocaust, it's crucial that we employ both meth methods of, of history as well as the methods of memory studies, the study of memory. So to give just one example of this dual focus, we can take the chapters devoted to the deportation of Spaniards to Nazi camps. Sarah Brennis, who just spoke to, who works on Mauthausen, and our colleague Soledad Fox, who investigates the representation of Jews in the work of uh, Spanish French memoirist and uh, novelist and survivor Jorge Simbrun, and myself, who's written about Spanish anti fascist women um, deported to Ravensbrück. All three of us understand that one of the transcendental experiences in the lives of these Spanish deportees is the fact of having witnessed from their position as victims of Nazi persecution, having witnessed the Shoah, the extermination of Jews during their own period of Nazi captivity. That is, they stood as witnesses to the genocidal fate of Jews, a fate that was radically different from their own, the torment of Jews in their respective camps. Um, Reyes Mate, the, the Spanish philosopher I just um, referred to, says we need history because it focuses on the reconstruction of facts and memory in the sense that to remember is to recognize the injustices suffered by victims in the past that continue to interpolate us in the present. Applying the methods of history, we discover the dimensions of the crimes committed while the study of memory teaches us about the experience of victims. So I'll just review again um, the structure of the workshop moving forward. Uh, Sarah Brennis will begin discussing Spaniards at uh, the Nazi camp, camp of Mauthausen. She has a recently published book on the subject that is soon to be published also in Spanish. We'll move on to the work of Joshua Good on the memories of that Axis Alliance in Francoist and post-Franco Spain. Then I'll talk to you about Spanish women prisoners at the Nazi camp of Ravensbrück. And finally, we'll end with Bob Cole's work on Spanish refugees in France who became fighters in the liberation of Paris. Okay. I think we're on the next slide. So I'm going to begin just by letting everyone know, again, the name of the volume that we uh, co-edited, Gina and I, is Spain, the Second World War, and the Holocaust, History and Representation. We'll just show that cover again, as there have been a couple of uh, questions about the name of the volume that we're talking about. So there you have it, uh, uh, published by the University of Toronto Press. And the book that uh, Gina just reference that I have written about Spaniards in Mauthausen is in, Mauthausen is in fact called Spaniards in Mauthausen, and it is also published by the University of Toronto Press. So today I'd like to talk about representations of the Spanish experience of Mauthausen, uh, the Mauthausen concentration camp, but I want to give some historical context first. So after the Spanish Civil War, the conflict that lasted from 1936 to 30, 1939, some half a million Republican refugees fled into France. While some became active in the French resistance, and Gina and Bob will both be talking more about that, many were interned in refugee camps along the southern border, the southern beaches of France. As World War Two closed in, the French authorities gave the refugees in the camp essentially a choice, return to Spain, 
which was would be quite a, a, a dismal future for them, enlist in the French army, or volunteer for a work detail to support the war effort. Thousands of Spaniards opted to join the Foreign Legion, the marching battalions, or a labor detail. And when France fell to the Nazis, many of these men were captured by the Germans and sent to prisoner of war camps, Stalags in Germany. Now, given Franco's disinterest in repatriating them, he did not consider them Spanish nationals, in fact, between 10 and 15,000 Spanish political dissidents were deported to Nazi concentration camps throughout the Third Reich. About 7,200 of them, the, the majority, ended up in Mauthausen, which is a Nazi concentration camp in Upper Austria. And the majority of those Spaniards were killed in the camp. Can we have the next slide? Among the 7,200, some 2,000 Spaniards did actually survive. They survived to see Mauthausen's liberation day on May 5th, 1945, and Mauthausen was liberated by the U.S. Army. Our understanding of Mauthausen, its prisoner population, and its role in the Holocaust really emerges in part from the memories of these Spanish survivors, who were primarily, but not all, anti-fascists. We can move to the next slide. In my research, I examine the testimony and representations that these survivors left behind, a very, very few number of those 2000 survivors. They left them in the form of oral histories, fiction, newspaper articles, uh, personalized histories, visual media. And those publications began really from the moment the camp was liberated from in 1945 up until today. In looking back at these works, we really begin to understand that the Spaniards in Mauthausen were not a faceless mass of people, but rather individuals who each had their own particular political beliefs, biases, and experiences of World War II and, and Nazi violence. Next slide, please. I think no one captures this divergence better than the first man to actually publish his account of an experience in a Nazi camp in Spain, Rodriguez de Risco, Carlos Rodriguez de Risco. He wrote a series of, of 34 serialized articles entitled, Yo he estado en Mauthausen, I was in Mauthausen, which were published in Arriba, the fascist newspaper, Franco's mouthpiece, uh, in the spring of 1946, just months after he was liberated from Mauthausen. That, that little amount of time that went that had passed since his liberation allows this memoir to be really an extremely detailed account of his experience in the camp, which includes names of fellow survivors and victims and of prisoner capos and SS, as well as dates, other historical information, down to the measurement of how much lethal chemicals were used in the medical experiments on, on prisoners. But at the same time, Carlos Rodriguez de Risco's series of articles have an unmistakable undercurrent of anti-Semitism and denialism. Uh, in one instance, he claims that Hitler had no knowledge of the concentration camps. And this, uh, this thread really makes him a pariah and uh, among his fellow anti-fascist deportees. Though I should note that it's not unprecedented in concentrationary camp literature to have denialist uh, threads, even from survivors. Um, I'm, I'm actually working on publishing a, an edition of this memoir, which will be annotated in Spain and I, my aim here is to add some nuance, nuance to the discussion of the deportation and the different individuals who, who survived. Next slide, please. It would take another 17 years in Spain before the publication of another Mauthausen survivor uh, account. And that next publication is Kiel Reich by Joaquim Amat Piniela. Uh, Amat Pinela was a Catalan intellectual who survived, was deported and survived Mauthausen after five years. And he began working on this book really the, ex at the exact same time as Rodriguez de Risco published his serialized memoir. But because of Franco's censorship, he could not get it published in Spain until 1963. This is a novel 
that never actually identifies Mauthausen by name, but in that Joaquim Amat Pinela was a survivor of Mauthausen, and we can clearly identify the camp as the main focus of the, of the novel. In my opinion, this is really one of the most balanced and poetic accounts ever written by a survivor, very worth reading. It has a detailed portrayal of the hierarchy in the camp from the Nazis to the SS, to the prisoner capos, to German prisoners, Spaniards, and Jews. And it's based on the actual prisoner population of Mauthausen. Jews are clearly at the bottom rung of this hierarchy. And the novel is cognizant of the difference between the experiences of Spaniards who had the possibility of surviving in Mauthausen and Jews who did not. Um, I'll also note that this novel is available in English translation for anyone is interested in, in reading it. It's an excellent translation. Next slide, please. By the 1970s, uh, Mariano Constante, another Mauthausen survivor, brought wider attention to the plight of survivors and their experiences by publishing an array of somewhat splashy paperbacks um, and making appearances on Spanish television to talk about his experiences. He was a young communist. He was only 20 years old when he was deported to Mauthausen. And he was quite active in the camp's clandestine resistance, which we should note was particularly involved in helping other prisoners survive, not necessarily, in fact, not they, there was no possibility to actually resist the, the Nazis themselves. Uh, Constante worked in the Mauthausen inner offices and when he published his, his accounts in the 1970s, he really exaggerated his role in the resistance movement, which rubbed some of his fellow survivors the wrong way. But at the same time, he encountered um, such a gamut of other Spanish uh, prisoners in Mauthausen that his accounts are incredibly important in, for the historical record. Some of the people that he encountered and, and represents in these books never were able to record their own testimony in any form. And so it's important to, to keep he, these, these books in mind. And I'll note here that they have never been translated. They're only available in Spanish. Uh, another crucial voice, and we can move to the next slide here, during the 1970s is Montserrat Roch. Montserrat Roch was a young Catalan journalist from Barcelona. And she also was actively writing novels during this period. She encountered Catalan survivors of the concentration camps um, in the 19, early 1970s in Barcelona and began them to track them down and interview them. So through really years of interviews and personal relationships that she formed with these men and women, Roch was able to compile them into just a groundbreaking testimonial account of Catalans who survived Nazi concentration camps. And it's also important to note that she gave early media exposure on Spanish television and in um, popular magazines to the topic. She, um, in the course of this work, was really able to capture a complex and symbiotic relationship between Spaniards and Mount and uh, Jews in the camps. Um, survivors told her, for instance, in Mauthausen, that when a convoy of Jews arrived and were killed in Mauthausen, it took the focus away from the Spanish prisoners who felt they could breathe easier because they wouldn't be the target of, of violence that day. And you can see from that example that she really was able to strip away the filters that some survivors felt in telling their stories. They told her things that were quite sensitive about visiting prostitutes, for instance, in the camps, about feelings of homophobia and anti-Semitism that were shared. Um, and she also was able to examine the consequences of the trauma of these experiences in the camps uh, and of being displaced people who, who for, largely remained outside of Spain after the war. So in my mind, this book is nothing short of a revelation in Spain, and it continues to be a foundational work on the topic. It has been translated to Spanish early on, but it has never been translated to English, unfortunately. The next slide will show us um, a, a mini boom of survivor memoirs that happened in the mid 90s. Um, you can see by this graphic that there was really something of an explosion of different survivor mem memoirs written by people who were not professional writers, who were representing their own stories, um, published. Some of these are self-published, others are published by very small 
editorials in, in different regions in Spain. And the most recent is down at the corner of your screen, um, a Mauthausen survivor's memoir that was actually edited by his son called Editar Mauthausen, which translates to Inheriting Mauthausen, which I think is a really apt title to get at the inherited legacy of children and grandchildren of the Spanish concentration camp victims and survivors. The last um, Spanish survivor of Mauthausen died in 2020. And so that marks the end of the firsthand memories um, of this experience. And the question is, what has replaced it? So we'll move to the next slide. In the last 10 years, new forms of media have uh, represented the Spanish experience in Nazi camps and have brought the topic to a wider audience and a new generation. But the question is, at what cost? Um, without the input of survivors, they have to recreate the experiences. And on your on your screen, you'll see four examples. One uh, at the far at the far uh, extreme is the imposter, a novel by Javier Cercas. That's actually the novelized account of a false survivor of a Nazi concentration camp, Enrique Marco, who fabricated um, what he said was his experience in a camp. He was never actually in a Nazi camp. And this novel focuses then on the false narrative as opposed to an actual survivor story. Then moving on, The Photographer of Mauthausen is a feature length film that recreates Mauthausen survivor Francesc Boisch's efforts to steal photo photographic evidence uh, from uh, of the Nazi crimes that occurred in Mauthausen and smuggle those negatives outside of the camp, which he did in actuality. He took photo photographic evidence of Nazi crimes to Nuremberg, although the film certainly sensationalizes um, some part of that, of that story. Another quite sensationalist new representation is the Netflix series Jaguar, which uh, works along the lines of the anti-Franco resistance struggle inside Spain and incorporates the stories of not actual stories, but invented stories of Mauthausen survivors. And I find this one particularly problematic in terms of its the way it, it uh, takes liberties with the actual history. And finally, on the other extreme of your screen, you'll see a Twitter account from a number of years ago called Deportado4443 uh, that recreates a Spanish prisoner's experience from inside the Mauthausen concentration camp in 140 character bursts. Um, another interesting way to represent sort of a diary, diary format from inside the camp. So clearly these new entries um, also contribute to a dehistoricization or a, a way of, of uh, sort of working along false histories of the topic by mixing fact and fiction, by bringing in false narratives, and by sensationalizing this history. Although this has had the effect of waking some portions of the, Spanish, of the Spanish public and indeed the world to a long ignored fact that there were Spaniards in Nazi concentration camps, we also um, you know, find that they, they can be a troubling way of actually encountering the real history. Nevertheless, I just wanna leave you with the idea that continuing to recognize the stories and histories of these deportees contributes to a national collective memory in Spain that is sorely needed in times of rising fascism, xenophobia, and anti-Semitism, which is indeed why I work on this topic to begin with. So thank you, and I'll pass it along to Gina. Hi there. So we're gonna move on to the presentation of Professor Josh Good. And Josh, are you ready? I am. I am. I, I thought you were going next. So, no, it's uh, it's Gina. It's Sarah, Josh, Gina, Bob. That's fine. I'm flexible. I can handle it. Excellent. Great. Well, uh, thank you. And it actually, it's a perfect segue, actually, from uh, Sarah's last couple comments, um, because we're moving on in for for what I'll be presenting. We'll be moving on from sort of memories of Spanish participation in the Civil War and and, and experiences during World War II, to um, the ways we sort of think about the impact of World War II's alliances on Spain, um, and how the memory of those alliances, particularly with Italy and and, and Nazi Germany, played out in both Francoist and and post Franco Spain. In particular, I'm looking at refugees or or or, or Nazis who found shelter um, and other 
members of the Axis parties who found shelter in Spain, um, and sort of not so much to think about the way they presented themselves and the way they like to celebrate themselves, but the way in which the regime, the Franco regime, uh, use them and use their images and use their presence in Spain for their own ideological purposes, and also how that use prefigures and in some ways anticipates our current memory comp, uh, comp discussions of memory in, in contemporary Spain or in, now in the post, post Franco uh, period. So, um, there has been some attention paid in recent years among historians and journalists to the presence of former Nazis uh, who sought and received refuge in Spain. Uh, uh, Sarah's brought up uh, one example of it. There's been attention paid to the business dealings, their differing levels of allegiance to Hitler and to, and to fascism. There's been some dedicated time spent, as we just saw, in popular culture and literature and film to the to the secret Nazi cabals living in Spain or Argentina or Brazil, the recent, the, the, the Netflix series Jaguar, dedicated to, to Spain's Nazi hunters. And as, as, as other historians have pointed out, including uh, one who's uh, in, in the audience right now, that um, the, the, the presence of Nazis and members of uh, former Axis powers who found refuge in Spain uh, you know, this, this coterie of people never really lived up to that kind of boys from Brazil image of remaking the Fourth Reich in Madrid um, that they that they and, and, and popular culture wanted to uh, cultivate. So what I've studied is less that kind of presentation of the Nazis, that sort of sensationalized presentation of people living in Spain, but really what, what captured my interest was the, the, the role that these figures actually played in Franco's uh, press apparatus in popular culture during the regime. And then, you know, again, now as we have a kind of historical reckoning, re-reckoning with Spain's past in, in, the, in the current world, how that memory of Spain's wartime alliances, um, again, largely understood as muted or as... Um, as, as mostly muted during uh, the Franco period, that the way that those people, those figures actually appeared in the Francoist press and society, and then how that image then sort of prefigures a kind of protean nature of the discussion of politics today uh, and, and, and the discussion of politics in the past. In other words, how we think about the way that Spain as a, as a kind of fascist or non-fascist party or its relationship to the crimes of World War II uh, inflect current conversations about Spain's memory of uh, the Spanish Civil War and of its democratic transition. So, uh, Dennis, next slide, please. And so I, I began that process of looking at sort of these residents in Spain with uh, a figure who uh, here represented in these images, the story of, uh, of Otto Skortseni, this figure on the left shaking hands with, with, with Hitler and on the right sitting at his um, work table in his Darmstadt prisoner, uh, allied prisoner of war camp after he was captured uh, at the end of World War II. Um, and for me, Skortseni and his life in Spain rep offers a kind of good case study or good point in presenting this complicated portrait of the politics of the 1930s and 1940s as they are discussed in Spain during Franco and, and the post-Franco period. And again, these are the sort of standard images. If you Google Skortseni, um, these images will come up relatively uh, quickly, right? The, the, the Hitler's commando here shaking hands with Hitler as he's given the assignment to liberate Benito Mussolini from his mountaintop prison uh, on the Gran Sasso in, in Italy in 1943, or here again on the right, as the studious wartime strategist and commando, uh, even though he's sitting captured in his Darmstadt uh, prisoner of war camp. Um, but again, the, the, the presentation that, that Skortseni, who also liked these images quite a bit and put them in every one of his autobiographies, which of which he wrote more than one, uh, you know, that presented him as uh, tactician, military prowess, his bravado and bravery, uh, and uh, as 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 a kind of studious um, uh, wartime thinker. Uh, next slide, uh, Dennis. 
And then, not perfect, but this is probably one of the more iconic images that Skorzeny also loved to use and has been used quite often for him. The moment when he climbs into the plane that was uh, used to liberate uh, Mussolini, who most of you recognize in the, in the hat, uh, with Skorzeny peeking over his shoulder over his left. Um, and the, the possible explanation for the look on Mussolini's face that this was an airplane built for two the pilot and Mussolini and Skorzeny, who never wanted to give up on a moment of of, of being uh, of being captured in, in in a photograph, leaning over his shoulder and taking off with Mussolini, so he can be there when the plane lands and Mussolini meets uh, is reconnected with Adolf Hitler and and, and um, Skorzeny can be there for uh, the photo op. Um, so you know so. This kind of image, the, the, the this is the, the this kind of standard self presentation of Otto Skorzeny and the way in which his uh, the accolades and the, the the positive biographies that have been written about him or his general kind of uh, reputation in the post war period. These are the kinds of images that capture that. Next slide, please, um, Dennis. And then uh, he escapes from this uh, prisoner, the Allied prisoner of war camp, roughly in 1948, uh, writes an autobiography, reappearing in Spain in about 1950, um, after he's published his, uh, this first memoir. And here in Spain, Skorzeny very quickly, this uh, uh, article from ABC in 1951, he very quickly lives, uh, 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 rather than a hidden, but a, a quite public life. Skorzeny is uh, a gadfly. Next, uh, next slide, actually. Um, Skorzeny is a gadfly, a political thinker. The, the, the prior image that I just uh, moved away from is his discussion of, in an interview with Victor de la Serna, the, you know, the fascist, uh, one of the fa fascist journalists of the Franco era. Um, in that interview, De La Serna talks to Skorzeny, and Skorzeny lays out an image of Hitler in 1951, not as a fascist leader or as a, a as a progenitor of the of, of the Nazi genocide, but rather as uh, the first real European political leader. And European meaning the first person who wanted to coalesce Europe into one grand community of people. So the Third Reich becomes the incipient European uh, community, and uh, and Hitler becomes the cold warrior who recognized early in, uh, early on the real threat of uh, of the Allied uh, of the Allied the USSR. Um, in in that article in 1951, and a topic that he returns to in in, in much of his public appearances and, and conversation uh, in Spain. In in this slide here, as he appears uh, throughout the Spanish press in. Uh, various acts as the as a or various sort of activities as the political thinker as the gadfly as uh, a, a, a man about town and I you know in the interest of time I removed a number of good images of well good or images of him uh, from Spanish television where he's in attendance at uh, social events and parties etc during this period of the 1950s and 1960s uh, next slide Dennis thanks uh, you know, and and throughout uh, the 1950s and 1960s, um, Skorzeny is converted from Nazi wartime hero to good businessman. To uh, the articles about him are you know often are accompanied by a photo of Skorzeny emerging from on an Iberian from an Iberian flight from some business trip that he's taken on behalf of Spain to West Germany or to uh, the Middle East, particularly Egypt. Um, and again, converting his image as uh, Skorzeny as, uh, and you know, in the way that he defended Hitler in the prior article, Skorzeny as a good German, as a man about town, as a no longer the Nazi war hero, but as a good businessman helping Spain uh, enter the pantheon of modern, anti-communist nations and engaging in, in good business. Um, here in this image from uh, 1954, you see also some 
sort of wisps of the past also never truly fading from uh, the conversation. Mussolini often, I'm sorry, uh, Scorzeni often photographed on an uh, annually appearing with Ramon Serrano Sunier, Franco's brother-in-law, uh, going together arm in arm to uh, memorial services in Madrid for Benito Mussolini for the Italian Duce. Here in 1954, sitting with Romano Mussolini, uh, Mussolini's son, who had become a relatively well-known um, jazz musician. And here Scorzeni photographed for, uh, for the popular press, sitting with Mussolini, Romano Mussolini, showing him actually the watch that Benito gave to Mussolini, uh, to Scorzeni uh, after his liberation from uh, the Grand Sasso. So again, new configurations, new images for uh, Scorzeni. And again, roughly in, in, in 19, uh, uh, throughout the 1950s and 60s, you see Scorzeni often referred to in general, uh, to, to no longer just referring to Hitler, but also to fascism writ large as uh, a, a third path away from derelict liberal democracy and, uh, and, and communism to uh, a neither left nor right political configuration. And he, in a sense, and maybe this is too cute by half, but in a sense, he, 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 he wants to present Hitler, Nazism, and fascism as a kind of not premature anti-communism, but as a prescient anti-communism. Um, and that's what sort of comes up in uh, in, in much of the discussions of Otto Skortseni uh, and in his appearances. Uh, next slide, Dennis. Here again, uh, another image, uh, 1974, the year before Skortseni um, uh, dies. Uh, Skortseni now, again, reappearing in the so society pages of ABC, uh, here in an interview with his wife Ilsa, you see uh, sitting comfortably on the on, in their Madrid apartment. Um, she's the niece of Hitler's finance minister, Jamar Schacht, who um, he married in 1954, um, who Scorsese married in 1954, and you know, in some ways is really the perhaps the power, uh, the real influencer in the in, in the relationship. Um, but here in this article, Swartzeni, uh represented as a good family man, as um, the, the article talks about the sparring, the, the eye rolling sparring between this married couple of now uh, over uh, of, of 20 years uh, and how they tease each other, et cetera. But no longer the, the, a, a political thinker or uh, now a, um, uh, uh, but as just a good family man. And I, I saw just a question pop up. This photograph is taken of him in his Madrid apartment, despite what the, uh, the, the caption says. Um, next slide. Thanks. But what other images of Swartzeni? One, one of the interesting issues that has come to light relatively recently um, you know, that I that I was not participant in, but I wanted to be more participant in, and I had a little bit of dealing with. Ilsa, Skorzeny's spouse, um, here photographed on the left in the middle, um, uh, passed away in 2014 and donated her papers or sold her papers or gave her papers to a family, uh, a, a, a friends of the family, who then sold it to um, an auction house. Those papers, uh, quite voluminous, were bought up uh, apparently by a North Carolina uh, sort of amateur historian and, and businessman who wants to write uh, stories of, of uh, wants to write a book about Scorzeni. But apparently, it's in those. You know, having spoken to the auction house and to the director of the auction house, apparently, it's really Ilsa who it's in those papers emerges as the real political and economic force. Again, niece of and close relations to. Uh, Hitler's finance minister, John Marshak. Um, but in any case, this alternate image that begins to emerge from that archive and from, um, uh, from uh, some other published work, we see other images of Otto Skorzeny coming to the fore. Here, the image on the left, um, Skorzeny in a nice moment of 
uh, playful repartee with, uh, with a family friend, the family friend who turns out to be, I don't know if anyone recognizes him, Klaus Barbie, the butcher of Lyon, before he's captured um, in, uh, in, in uh, Bolivia and uh, extradited back to France, where he's put on trial in 1987. This photograph of the two of them dancing uh, together and uh, sort of horsing around at his Mallorca, at, at, at Scorzeni's Mallorca uh, villa. Here, a photograph on the right of Scorzeni engaging in the Nazi salute, uh, a, a photograph from the early uh, 1970s uh, on a Madrid street. So again, more complicated views of Scorzeni is not just a, a, a cold warrior or a prescient early anti-communist, but actually also as a lingering supporter of, uh, of, of, of this uh, darker, more nefarious past. Next slide, and I'll be finishing up in a second. Here, uh, what also appears, now sort of thinking about, you know, Scorzeni dies uh, in uh, October of 1975, sorry, July of 1975, and then in the post-Franco period, Scorzeni over the past couple of years has um, enjoyed a, 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 a renaissance of attention, not just the republication of his few memoirs, but also books that really are, are tackling the, the, the legend of, what, of, of, of how he liked to describe himself and as he was described uh, ostensibly by the OSS as the most dangerous man in Europe. Uh, in other words, his, his focus on his daring do, on his, uh, you see at the bottom of the screen, of, of his freeing Mussolini from the mountaintop prison, um, and not so much as an ideological figure. And in fact, most of the conversations really avoid the idea, avoid conversations about what he knew about the Shoah and what he knew about and, and what his real allegiances were to Nazi ideology. Um, and so there are legions, many, many books written by journalists, um, scholars about Scorzeni and his life, some of which just captured here in my, in my attempt to do a collage, which was new for me in the PowerPoint world, but I tried. Um, you can leave in the comments my success in doing a collage. Uh, next slide. And then lastly, uh, in 2020, during uh, another uh, film has just emerged. In addition to the Netflix series of Jaguar, et cetera, uh, uh, another film has just appeared, not again, um, and not just on Netflix, but released in, uh, through Netflix in, in the United States, at least, that uh, focuses on Scorzeni. And I just, I put this up just to sort of give a sense of the trajectory of uh, how we talk about this per person in particular. This film came out much to my consternation as Sarah and Gina know, right as the book was, I think, just coming out, not even going into press. So I didn't really get to tackle it, but having watched it now, what, what, what's most surprising, what I thought was most challenging and interesting was the bit in red, Otto Scorzeni in Spain, that there was gonna be a conversation in this film about the kinds of tendrils and fingerprints that Otto Scorzeni had left in Spain. And that in many ways, what this bi biopic is, is really focusing on the main title, the old image of, and, and the sort of typical image of Otto Scorzeni, not sort of washed of his ideological self, of his political identity, and more as gadfly, person of intrigue, and this kind of image of him as, uh, as, as a dangerous man, that sort of self-styled image. Um, and, and, you know, just in, in 10 seconds, just to sort of put a bow on this conversation, the idea that what I see in Scorzeni and uh, among some of the other figures that I'm looking at is, you know, if we think about sort of Spain's current, if you, you know, reading Sebastian uh, Faber's uh, most recent book and other conversations about memory contests, debates about how we remember uh, the, uh, Spain's past and how it's debated today, you know, we, we recognize that these memory contests are, you know, are defined by a surprising openness and an almost moral flimsiness about attitudes towards Franco and towards the crimes of the state and sort of having an honest reckoning with what has happened in the past. And in some ways, what increasingly I see this work, not so much as, uh, or my work is not so much reflecting on the sort of current explaining the current 
flimsiness or 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 or, or moral flimsiness of the current conversations the the lack of consensus the lack of a kind of unified understanding of a u or the construction of a usable past in spain of this time period but actually really that this sort of desire to find multiple multi-directional memories as uh uh, as a, a, a one memory scholar puts it, this multi multi-directional memories have existed in Spain since uh, the end of, of of World War II. And so, with that, I probably went over time. Thank you for for your attention. Great, thank you, Josh. That was fascinating, and I hope that those of you who have joined us today have a sense now from the juxtaposition of Sarah's discussion of. Spaniards in Mauthausen and Josh's discussion of Europe's most dangerous man in Spain, you can get a sense of the of the breadth of um, the the issues uh, that the volume attempts to uh, address. Um, so, can we get the next slide, Dennis, please? Um, so, my chapter. Uh, let me just uh, say that I want to thank Sarah for covering some important. Uh, background information for me. Um, much of what she's described about the trajectory of, of uh, Spaniards who fled uh, Spain at the end of the Spanish Civil War into France, uh, uh, being held in French concentration camps or, or um, centers that held women and children across over the, the Franco-Spanish border um, apply to women as well. Um, so my chapter in the book is related to work I've carried out for many years now on the lives of Spanish anti-fascist women and their resistance activities during the Spanish Civil War, during the Franco dictatorship, and in French resistance groups during the Second World War. So um, to show how the Nazi camp for women, so the Nazis created a camp uh, specifically for women in Germany called Ravensbrück. So how this, the history of this, of Spanish and Catalan women in this camp um, works to shed light on larger phenomena associated with the Holocaust and World War II memory in Spain, I'm, I'm gonna touch on a few points. Um, first, I wanna give a cursory overview of the camp and then I'll discuss very briefly two of the primary published accounts by Catalan women survivors. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these works by Neus Catala. Um, Neus Catala was a member of the United Socialist Youth. She uh, fled uh, Catalonia into France. She joined the resistance. She worked with uh, her first husband who was a, a anarchist French resistance member. They ran an important uh, uh, safe house. She was captured and tortured by the SS and eventually deported to Ravensbrück uh, where she was put to slave labor um, and she survived the camp and then is known um, as the woman who has many ways um, continued uh, the work of Montserrat Roch that Sarah mentioned who started collecting testimonies of men who had survived the camps and Neus Catala in part in conversation with uh, Montserrat Roch began to collect um, the testimonies of, of women um, with whom she had been in the resistance or in, in the Nazi camp of Ravensbrück. Next slide, please. Um, uh, Mercedes Núñez Targa uh, was a, an important um, Communist Party leader in Galicia. She also um, wrote uh, two books about the period of her anti-fascist resistance, one that, that focuses on Spain, the other during her captivity in a Nazi camp. So both Neus Catala and Mercedes Núñez Targa repeatedly stress in their works the theme of solidarity networks among prisoners, women prisoners. And in this way, they echo um, camp memoirs from political survivors all over, all over Europe. Uh, memoirs and accounts that privilege the theme of communist camaraderie and the importance of trying to incorporate acts of sabotage into their slave labors as a means of maintaining their humanity and their political dignity. Next slide, please. 
The only camp, uh, Nazi camp that was designed for women was Ravensbrück, located about 90 kilometers north of Berlin, near the beautiful spa town of uh, Furstenberg. And today it's an official memory site and archive of the state of Brandenburg in Germany. Of the total of approximately 120 women and children imprisoned in the camp, some 20% were Jewish, 80% were political prisoners, some of whom were also Jewish, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, women with criminal records, and so-called asocials. Many deportees entered the slave labor force that included, for example, heavy outdoor physical labor or assembling V2 uh, rocket parts. And uh, the next slide shows um, a drawing. Dennis, next slide, please. Yes, this is a drawing that shows um, women's slave labor walking into the Siemens camp that was uh, adjacent to the Robinsbrook camp. Um, in addition to incarcerating and punishing female political or other prisoners, Ravensbrück was a training site for Nazi women guards. Um, I want to stress how even today the Spanish and Catalan survivor group has been comparatively neglected within the literature, historiography, and commemorative practices of Ravensbrück. I'll just give one example that stands for others. A um, his, uh, historian named Sarah Helm published a 2015 book, a fat book on the history that claims to be um, uh, comprehensive uh, about, um, about Ravensbrook. She fails to mention Spanish prisoners at all, which I find to be either an excusable or disingenuous oversight, particularly when we consider the Spanish Civil War affiliation or affection, the interbrigadista and transnational pedigree of so many of the political deportees to the camp. Undoubtedly, Spanish women constituted a tiny group of camp inmates and probably no more than two or 300 women across, Spanish and Catalan women were detained across all Nazi camps. And the Ravensbrück Memorial today puts the number at about 170 Spanish women who passed through uh, that camp's gates. And the difficulty in determining the figure resides primarily with the fact that most Spanish women were retained, uh, detained as members of the French resistance, which means they often were um, logged into the camp system with uh, French aliases. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the most celebrated Spanish survivor of Ravensbrück was Neus Catala, who died relatively recently, uh, well over 100 years old. Um, here we see her in a portrait after deportation. She managed somehow to hold on to her camp uniform and, and donned it for, for this important portrait that, to commemorate her period in the camp. Um, after the war, she decided from her exile in France to track down and interview every single Spanish or Catalan woman survivor of the Ravensbrück camp and the French resistance that she could locate. Her assemblage of women's oral testimonies, which was published in 1980, is the most important collection of Spanish women's accounts of Nazi persecution. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is the 1984 um, edition of uh, Neus Catala's book, and it has been repeatedly um, republished. Um, next slide, please. The second autobiographical text, which I mentioned at the beginning of my intervention here, um, fleshes out the history of Spanish women in the camps, but this is a literary memoir. Um, titled Destinada al Crematorio, uh, Destined for the Crematory. Uh, indeed, there was a, a towards, uh, in, in, in early 1945, the SS, the SS set up a provisional gas chamber at Ravensbrook next to the crematorium and somewhere between five and 6,000 prisoners were gassed there in the winter and spring of, uh, of uh, 1945. Um, so both the work of Targa the book you see here, and the collection of oral testimonies published by Catala, uh, describe how French and Spanish women uh, cooperated during the resistance. 
They relate the story of their deportation and their narrations focus a great deal of attention on support networks for and strategies for clandestine forms of resistance in the camp that helped women survive. Their books pose uh, an important question and that is how did politically committed women, largely communists, these women from Spain and Catalonia who most of whom did not speak French or Czech or German or Polish. How did they organize themselves with other national groups of political prisoners in their attempts to stave off the effects of unpredictable acts of violence and corporeal degradation? How did the bonding between women prisoners resist the annihilationist functionality of the violent sadistic bonding between male and female perpetrators in order some very sadistic uh, Nazi women guards at this camp. So the works by Nunez Targa and Neos Catala don't veer from archetypes that typically reveal themselves in communist uh, camp literature. These plot lines include uh, arrest, uh, torture, interrogation at the hands of the SS or the French milice who would uh, co collaborating with, with the SS, transport and arrival at the camp, they relate anecdotes about the cultural, ethic, ethnic, linguistic, national, ideological, and socioeconomic diversity in the camp. And they highlight where they can the bonds of solidarity forged through a shared women's history of anti-fascist resistance among women from different nations. They narrate many episodes of death and murder, as well as efforts to assist the sick and dying. They talk about a gallery of multinational characters and they express that survivors continue to feel the pain of the still opened wound of being witness to the Shoah. This is something that Sarah mentions in her work as well. And that is you have political prisoners inhabiting the same camp uh, landscape or geography as uh, Jewish populations who are targeted for annihilation. Um, the women often discuss uh, the drama and terror of, of near misses. Uh, I almost met my end in the gas chamber. I uh, was near death in, in, in the infirmary. Um, I was tortured and, and managed to, to revive. Um, and their stories usually conclude with the memory of liberation, which is a moment in many cases of of the expression of great joy, but it's tempered in, in these memoirs and oral histories, on the one hand, by the bi biological reality of femaleness, like the difficulty of having undergone long-term uh, so psychological and medical effects of, of, of torture, deprivation, uh, psychological abuse, uh, starvation, exposure, et cetera, as well as, uh, by the long period of post-war adjustment to a life in exile, usually in France, since returning to Franco Spain was not an option. So among all these varied themes, it's remarkable that in all of the testimonies and autobiographical texts that we have about Spanish women uh, detained in Ravensbrück and other camps, women want to present themselves as heroes in the continuing anti-fascist struggle. And that means that they devote most space to acts of sabotage. Um, this makes sense for two reasons. One is temporal and the other ideological. Most women at Ravensbrück, not Jewish political prisoners, were put to slave labor. And therefore the majority of the time in the camp was spent in factories or in labor details, perhaps at satellite camps under excruciating and sometimes fatal Conditions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, a camp. This is Dachau, and it shows men in in, in armament uh, slave labor. We don't have, uh, as far as I know, extant photographs of women doing armament slave labor um, assembly manufacture. But this gives you an idea of what uh, an assembly line floor might look like in a Nazi camp. Um, so the survivors demonstrate good recall for the, the labor, the often starving, risk of beating, work sessions bracketed usually with um, sometimes long and deadly roll calls. 
Um, but particular attention is paid to the labor in these testimonies, which fulfills an abiding communist imperative to highlight always acts of resistance as sabotage during uh, incarceration. And so the function of the sabotage storyline in the account then speaks not only to the facts on the ground, but also pulls in this tiny Spanish population, Spanish women population into a larger community of communist women bold enough to try and defeat the production of fan, Spanish uh, fascist munitions. So Neus Catala and uh, Mercedes Nunez Targa uh, turn time and again to their comrades' acts of sabotage. How would they try to defeat the assembly line? They tell humorous stories about how they would, they would um, grab flies and crush them up and try and mix them into... Um, armament powder, how they would use spit, um, how they would distract a guard in order to uh, make some mistake in the assembly process. Um, so so they, they wanted to show that Spanish women were participating in this anti-resist, anti-fascist resistance work too within the camp. Um, and that they were at the vanguard. They were the women who had participated in, in anti-fascist resistance before any other nation in the 1930s in Spain. And Neus Catala wrote, she said, although hunger twisted our stomachs, we were unable to steal bread from one another, but for the struggle against our captors, we were perfect thieves. Sabotear, 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 sabotage, sabotage, sabotage. So I want to look now briefly at, at one slide, uh, the next slide, um, that, that talks about why slave labor sabotage is so important in these texts. Um, first, it conforms to communist post-war stories and myths that celebrate the continuation of anti-resistance, anti-Nazi resistance within the camps. First, the Spanish Civil War, then the Francoist, uh, excuse me, then the French resistance, and then the resistance continuing in, in the camps. Uh, this focus also complies with Spanish exile identity that views the resistance as a single anti-fascist project. Um, beginning with the Spanish Civil War, you fight fascism all the way to the, to the, to the death of Franco. It also um, reinforces this halo of Spanish, the Spanish Civil War um, veteran, woman veteran, which garners respect across, across national groups of politicals who admire the Spaniards um, for having um, carried out the first anti-fascist work. Um, it provides a frame for social belonging uh, for the Spanish women, primarily among French women political prisoners. And it also creates a sense of identity, uh, community, and it, women are, 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 are suffering from incredible stress and terror or not having a large cohesive national group like Poles or Germans or French did. So in carrying out slave labor, they sort of proved their mettle and it invited protection and support um, from women from other nationalities with whom they could not speak for linguistic reasons, but these were factors as protection and support that corresponded strongly with survival. And finally, it casts deportation as an event in which women had some agency. They wanted to cast themselves, they wanted to represent themselves as communist heroines, not as victims of Nazi terror. And I'll just finish with the last slide, Dennis, if um, you can give me the last slide. This is a list of the women for whom we have um, oral or written accounts of their detention in Robinsbrook and other um, satellite camps where they underwent um, slave labor and who survived. And with that, I conclude my comments and I pass on um, the microphone to Bob Cole. <coughs> Okay, um, hello everyone. Uh, good evening from Paris. Uh, I think I'm the furthest east of the, of the participants. Um, something to link in really quickly to what Gina just said. Um, in Paris yesterday, there was a film was premiered. Its title is Simone from Simone Veil, who was the French, uh, was deported to Auschwitz, survived Auschwitz and became a minister of France in the, in the, in the government in the 1970s as was instrumental in passing the French law on abortion in the 1970s. So there's a audio, audiobiographical film about her that just came out in France. 
Um, so thank you, Gina and Sarah, for inviting me to the roundtable discussion, and Dennis for the for the technical aspects. And thanks to my colleagues, everyone, for for their interesting talks. Um, the scope of my article is a little is broader than the talk I'm going to give tonight. I was given 12 minutes, so I'm going to li limit my comments to one uh, one Spanish loyal as, loyalist as an example of the many others who fought in the French army. Could I have the next slide, please, Dennis? One of the approximately 500 Spaniards who, when given the opportunity, chose to follow the call of General de Gaulle and ended up in the Leclerc division was Lucas Camons Portillo of Santander. He served from 1943 to 1945 as a sergeant in La Nueve, the 9th Infantry Company of the 3rd Battalion of the Chad Regiment. Next slide, please. At the very end of the Spanish Civil War in March 1939, Lucas Camons was serving as a lieutenant in the port city of Valencia, where he was fortunately able to board the Les Adrieux, which is the second boat in this picture, uh, at the last minute with 500 other refugees and found themselves in Oran in French North Africa. Next slide, please. During the period of quarantine uh, that the French authorities imposed on the refugees in the port, Lucas Camons began to record his experiences. Up, oh, go back one. Um, to record his experiences, and this war diary is the only known text penned by a Spanish loyalist who served in the Leclerc division. By May of 1939, the refugees had been disembarked, and men of military age were sent to an internment camp, Camp Moran. Moran in the hinterland of French Algeria. Next slide, please, Dennis. After one month in Camp Morand, this is a photo there, uh, Luc Escamons wrote of his general morale of the people, I quote, the days go by and our future in Camp Morand with barbed wire enclosures all around and Senegalese soldiers who howl more than they speak. As time went by, we suffered ever worsening conditions. End of quote. By the spring of 1939, it was obvious to the French authorities that despite the departure of thousands of refugees to Latin America, and regardless of those who had accepted to return to Franco Spain, large numbers of exiles were going to remain in France. In an attempt to meet the persistent refugee crisis, the French authorities created foreign labor camps that Sarah mentioned for all foreigners aged 20 to 48 who had requested political exile in France. By October of 1939, there were approximately 55,000 Spanish refugees, men, serving in 227 uh, foreign labor companies in metropolitan France. Next slide, please. Following the success in mainland France, labor companies were set up in North Africa in December of 1939, and Lucas Camons was assigned as a cadre to one of these companies. After his initial exhilaration at the prospect of leaving the internment camp, reality set hold. In April of 1940, Lucas Camons left a blunt description of the extreme labor conditions in the construction of the Trans-Saharan Railroad across the desert. And I quote, the climate and work were unbearable. Men fell exhausted, ill, or died. In two weeks, 50% of the Spaniards were ill and 5% had died. Due to this, we began to protest and stop working. The protest spread to other companies, but there was no solution in sight because no one was about to listen to us. The only tangible result of our actions was to be sent off to the disciplinary company. This was a crime in itself. In about four days, 1,000 Spaniards were sent there. Nevertheless, we were successful in spreading the word outside the camps concerning the conditions and crimes that were committed against us. But no one worried about our problems. The lives of 9,000 Spaniards was not worth much. We found ourselves alone and without consolation. End of quote. I note that this is in April, May of 1940, so it's not yet the Vichy regime. It's still the French Republic. Next slide, please. From the very moment they arrived in France, other than returning to Spain or immigrating to another company, joining the French Foreign Legion was one of the most direct methods of uh, eluding internment. However, the veterans of the Spanish Republican Army generally disdained the Legion as little more than mercenaries or misfits and outlaws seeking to distance themselves from a blemished past. 
Nevertheless, by the end of 1939, the harsh conditions of internment had convinced approximately 3,000 Spaniards to enlist. This number was 27% of all Legionnaire recruits for 1939. Lucas Camons resisted joining the Legion in 1939, but the extreme labor conditions along the Trans-Saharan Railroad compelled him to change his mind and enlist in June of 1940. Although the discipline and training were severe, his interpretation of his new situation was probably shared by many veterans of the Loyalist Army at the time, and I quote, basic training is very harsh here, but you can withstand it when there is plenty to eat and you have your freedom, end of quote. Interesting, how do we interpret that he considers being in one of the most severe French military units as having your freedom is very interesting. Unfortunately for Lucas and many of his Spanish comrades, they were discharged from the Legion in October of 1940 after the armistice with Nazi Germany. And he found himself returned to the same area he had left in, in May. He was to spend the next two years in a narrow strip of desert along the Moroccan-Algerian border between Ain Sefra, Colomb Bashar, and Gadadza. When the Anglo-American invasion of North Africa occurred in November 1942, Lucas Camons took advantage of the confusion and escaped from his labor camp and joined the Allies. Trained as a mechanic in Santander when he was young, he rapidly found work in Oran with the Americans. Notwithstanding this, his valuable job, and after savoring some seven months of freedom as a civil contractor, in July 1943, he decided to once again take up arms and join his Spanish comrades who were serving with the Free French. The immense majority of Spaniards who ended up in the Leclerc division served in the four infantry companies of the 3rd Battalion of the, of the Chad Regiment. As such, they precipitate, excuse me, as such, they participated in several key battles, namely the Falaise Gap, the liberation of Paris, the Lorraine Campaign, the liberation of Strasbourg, the Battle of the Colmar Pocket, and the Mad Rush in April, May of 1945 from France to Austria. Next slide, please. Certainly the most famous episode of the Leclerc Division with great political as well as military importance was the liberation of Paris. But Lucas Camons and the rest of his platoon were not in the famous column that entered the capital on the evening of August 24th. He entered Paris at the end of the divisional column the next morning, which paradoxically turned out to be more dangerous than that of his comrades the night before. Quoting from his um, diary, at nine in the morning, upon entering Paris, my platoon was separated from the column by German resistance. After fighting through it a few, a, few, a few blocks further on, it seemed like the war had ended. Everyone was welcoming us with open arms. It was an emotional moment. I had never seen such a fantastic scene in my life. The half-tracks and tanks looked like streetcars, as everyone was climbing all over them, reaching up to us as if we were gods. Everywhere we stopped, we were swamped by women who kissed us despite our dirty faces and uniforms. It was very emotional for us. As long as I live, I will always remember our triumphant entry into Paris. We spent a few happy days in Paris. Everywhere we went, we were welcomed, and we weren't allowed to pay for anything, as we were congratulated by everyone. All doors were open to us. It was no longer 1939 and 1940 when we were thought of as good for nothings and wretched souls." End of quote. The next day, La Nueve participated in Charles de Gaulle's victory parade on the Champs-Élysées. This is a picture from that parade and Lucas Calons is the soldier without a helmet, who's not wearing a helmet, in this half track that he named Guernica. The next slide, please. The entrance into Paris was long remembered by, by the men who experienced it, but the campaign to liberate France was far from over in August 1944. The Leclerc division had many months of hard campaigning ahead of it, and the path to Paris, from Paris to Austria, is dotted with the tombs of Spanish loyalist volunteers. One week after this photograph from the Alsace campaign, this is January 1945, one week after this photograph was taken, Lucas Camons was the only one left in ranks. Three of the men in this picture were wounded and the others were evacuated with frozen feet. Next slide, please. Camons' anti-fascist commitment was constant and in several passages, 
of his diary, he goes beyond describing daily events to include reflections on the broader implications of the war and the future downfall of Franco. For example, at the close of the war, elements of the Kirk division participated in the conquest of the cradle of Nazism. How ironic that a very few of the soldiers who entered the town in May of 1945 were men who had been fighting fascism since 1936. With the German army on the point of total surrender, Camons wrote, and I quote, at the end of the day, we arrived in Berchtesgaden, linked up with the American forces and took the town. Thus the town where Hitler had has his general headquarters fell. At last, we were the Spanish who got to Hitler's house and we were able to show the world that those who lost the war in Spain were conquerors in the heart of Germany and took part in the death stroke against fascist armies, which were such a danger to democracies. And we are preparing ourselves to give Franco and his gang what they deserve. In Berchtesgaden, one can see the once powerful German army in the most humiliating defeat. Its generals and colonels down to the lowliest private are no longer the proudest soldiers in the world like they thought they were with their policy of trickery and misery, end quote. These few lines of his personal diary illustrate what must have been the mindset of not only the Spanish and the Leclerc division, but also that of many, if not all the loyalists who volunteered to continue the fight in uniform under the banner of France. The Camons family, to some extent, exemplifies the different sacrifices of Spanish exiles in, Fra in France. In fact, there are three Camons brothers who were exiled in France in 1939. Lucas participated in the military victory over Nazi Germany as a non-commissioned officer in the Leclerc division. His younger brother, Felix, survived the war as a farm laborer in the south of France. He was able to get out of the camps in the south of France and work in a farm for the five years. And tragically, their eldest brother, Eduardo, was deported from France in 1940 and murdered in the Nazi death camp of Hartheim, a satellite of Mauthausen in 1941. So there you have an example of the Spanish who, despite being interned in camps, uh, joined the French army to continue the struggle as of 1943 and ended up victorious in 1945. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. That was great. Um, if I could just uh, take over for one second. Uh, we are coming up on uh, 4.30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, unfortunately, uh, Josh Good had um, academic commitments, which is good. It's good that he's teaching students about all these things. Um, and uh, so I think uh, I know the, you know, we kind of have a rough runtime of 90 minutes, but if people would like to stick around, maybe we can do Q&A for 20 to 30 minutes. Is that acceptable to the panel? Sure. Okay, great. Uh, again, this for the for those who have uh, who have commitments have to leave. This will be available on Alba's YouTube channel, and I'm going to send that YouTube channel link to an email to everybody who registered along with an evaluation form to tell us how we did. So, um, yeah, I think I'll start. I know. Please continue to put your questions in the chat. Um, put put your questions in the chat, but I've been recording them as you've done that um, throughout the uh, throughout the. Uh, the time we've been here, so I'll begin with um, I'll begin with uh, Mitchell Grubler. Uh, if you would like to ask the question that you asked before uh, in the program yourself, I'll let you do so now. You can unmute. If not, I can ask it for you. Okay. Okay, if Mitchell joins us, uh, he can maybe jump in, but I'll just ask what the question was. And I think this was asked during um, Sarah's pre presentation. So the, the question is, what were the jobs of some of the survivor memoirists in the camps? Like, yeah, who, what was the demographic, the profile of, oh, uh, I believe Mitchell is actually here, if you'd like to say something. Yeah. 
yeah. So what were the jobs? The I, can, I can go ahead and, and answer Mitchell's question. Thank you for that for that question. So um, in some cases, they had rather what we would consider privileged positions in the camp. Um, I can take, for example, Mariano Constante, who's one of the memoirists that I um, spoke about in that section of the presentation. Mariano Constante was a porter for the SS. That is, he, he did odd jobs and uh, worked in the inner offices, in the Gestapo offices um, for the SS as well. There were other Spanish prisoners who also had similar roles um, but they weren't all in terms of pri privileged positions. They weren't all in the offices. Some of them even just worked in the kitchens peeling potatoes or worked somewhere outside of the elements. But there are certainly some of the Spanish survivors who would, did not have some sort of protected um, position in the camp. There were people who survived after working for five years in the labor, in really the most brutal labor conditions outside in the harsh Austrian climate. And um, despite that, we're able to survive. So there, it really runs a gamut between um, survivors who, who had some sort of position in an interior space, typically a photo lab or the SS garages, for instance, and those who like many of those who died in the first couple of years of, of their deportation, worked outside in harsh um, physical labor in, under very difficult conditions. Could I add something? Or uh, just jump in? I mean, it depended on um, what the prisoner, what, what his job description was before he got to the camp and some ex I mean, the we can quote the cite the example of Jorge Simprun, who was a young was arrested in the French resistance 1943, I think it was 43, and was sent to Buchenwald. But he he spoke German, so he was able to get a job in the office. He was a student, by the way, just a, but he spoke German, so that's how he got a, an office job. Great, thank you, thank you to everybody. Um, I will now turn. Um, over to uh, if Deirdre Kelly, if you'd like to ask your question, you can go ahead and do so now. Hi, I uh, just want to say, first of all, thank you so much to the editors and the the contributors to the volume and to those who are presenting today. Um, I really enjoyed the, the presentation. And I've read some of the chapters from the volume and really, really enjoyed it as well. Uh, sorry, I'm just taking time to find my question. <laughs> um, so yes, I mentioned, um, and Gina, thanks for your for your link on that about uh, Spain's uh, new democratic memory law. But I'm, th I'm thinking more in terms of, um, because one of the, the, the parts of the new democratic memory law is in relation to um, education and I suppose, bringing in the, the, the topics of related topics or the, the marginal topics around the Spanish Civil War into the education system. So I suppose, I don't know if it's a question really as such, but um, what's your view? Where do you see Holocaust studies and the, the merging with um, Spain and the Holocaust? Do you see that becoming more of a central focus in Spain or people becoming more aware of, of it? Um, that's one of my questions. Will I just leave it there for the moment? <laughs> Do you want me to ask my other question before I- oh, Sure, go ahead. We can try and answer both of them at once. Okay, um, the other question is for Sarah. And it's, um, I read your volume also, and I really enjoyed that as well. Um, I was just wondering if you've come across any texts that other texts apart from El Triangulo Azul that deal with the, um, based on the Spanish experience of Nazi camps that tell the story from the perspective of the perpetrator. So that's it. Thank you, Deirdre. And I appreciate your kind words about the volume. That's an easy question because the answer is no. Um, with the exception of the Mariano Constante book about, it's called Yo Fui Portero del SS, SAS. I was a porter for the SS. He does try to get inside the head of the SS um, to a certain extent, in particular as he's 
describing there was uh, one uh, black Catalan prisoner in Mauthausen and in that volume Constante describes the racial hierarchies and the racial you know um, conceptions that the Nazis held in relation to that Spanish prisoner but um, aside from from that book and Kael Reich as well to a certain extent deals with, again, not necessarily jumping inside the head of the Nazis, but to try to express sort of what the Spaniards perceived that the Nazis may have been um, thinking about or, or the attitudes that they held or the ideologies that they held or lack thereof. Um, that novel also tries to sort of to sort of represent that some of that perspective. But aside from that, and the play that you mentioned, El Triangulo Azul, is, is a really interesting uh, because it, it uh, sort of portrays Paul Ricken, who was uh, one of the um, as Nazis who was in charge of the photography lab and does really try to get inside his head. So um, those are three examples and I have not encountered others. Okay, thanks very much. That's really helpful. Thank you. I would follow up with what uh, Sarah mentioned, um, Sarah's presented, Sarah and I have both discussed and presented on representations of uh, Matthausen and the character of Paul Ricken is very, is very interesting. Um, he's was uh, the, 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 the SS boss of um, Francesc Boisch who was working in the identification lab. And both um, El Triangulo Azul that Sarah mentions and a graphic novel um, about Nathausen and the film that Sarah um, cited, El Fotografo de Nathausen, all try to work through some interior interiority of, of the Paul Rican character. But I, you know, your question makes me think a little further about the fact that Spaniards were such a minority in the in the Nazi camps so that although there's a vast bibliography uh, within Holocaust studies on perpetrator literature including some fascinating recent work about women guards I mean Spaniards in and of themselves I think aren't don't merit that much attention as a particular um, national group um, because their their numbers were so tiny, and this continues to be a battle at at Ravensbrück to have the Spanish and Catalan women um, represented in commemorative um, in commemorative practices. Um, as to your question about Holocaust education, um, the 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 law has just you know continues to. Um, be recycled and re and reinvented in, in different iterations. I would. Um, be happy to uh, put you in touch with Marta Simo, who is a contributor to our volume, who's a specialist on who's written in our volume about Holocaust educations in Spain, and who would be the best candidate for addressing the ways in which Holocaust education will now be in, incorporated into different autonomous regions, and what's what's the, what's the latest about how the law of historical memory um, uh, will be. Um, incorporating Holocaust education to Spanish classrooms. So uh, just uh, uh, send send me an email and I'll, and I'll put you in touch with um, with um, with Marta. Um, okay, uh, this is sort of um, related to the body of work. Um, David Grant will ask the questions about the kind of English language literature. If uh, David, if you'd like to ask your question, you can go ahead and do so now. Um, yeah, so um, uh, I think Gina's kind of hinted upon it already, but um, what is your view that um, other than the work of, say, Sarah's work and um, on Matt Hausen and the work of Wingate Pike, uh, why has so little work been published in the English language? Did you that? Okay. I mean, I, I I can only speculate, but um, I think it's perhaps, um, although I don't agree with this position, that it does not seem as relevant to an English speaking audience, except that, you know, we know my next research project, I hope to, uh, 
sort of address that. The, the U.S. Army liberated Mauthausen. There, there's a, a lot of implication, um, just as we've seen with the Ken Burns, the recent Ken Burns documentary, U.S. and the Holocaust, that there's an extraordinary amount that um, is relevant to English speaking audiences in terms of the of the Holocaust and the Second World War. Now, the perception may be that the, the, the sort of a story of, of non-Jewish victims, such as the Spaniards, a relatively small victim group might not be as relevant. Again, I, I don't agree with that, but I think we're, uh, we're attempting to address that, um, that and in fact, this edited volume really was a, a, a direct um, yes. response to that absence. And uh, many of the chapters in the volume uh, are from scholars in Spain who published in English for the first time, first time. Uh, their research. Yeah. Do you, all, do you all know, Sarah or Gina, do you know if Benito Bermejo's book uh, has been translated into English? I know it's translated into, Spanish, into French. I think his book on the photog uh, yeah, uh, on photographer, Frances Boish, um, I, it's in Catalan, it's in Spanish. I'm not sure, actually. It's in German, I think it's been and translated. French, yeah. I'm not sure. And French, I'm not sure if it's made it into English yet. Okay. But Benito Bermejo is another extraordinary resource. resource. Um, his works in Spanish and Catalan, French and German are really important. Um, this question was asked by Robert Schaefer. Um, I don't believe he may not, he may have blogged off, but maybe he'll see this in the recording. So I'm just going to ask the question to the panel. Um, how does Paul Preston's book, arguing, arguing that there was an exterminationist angle by Franco's forces in the Spanish Civil War against the alleged Jewish Masonic Bolshevik conspiracy, relate to the various essays in your book on the Holocaust and World War II itself? Um, I think, yeah, so that's sort of the question. I'll throw it to the panel, whoever wants to jump in. Sarah, Bob, you want to start? It's complicated. Sure. <laughs> Bob, go ahead. Please talk. No, I, I don't have any. I mean, I, I think I don't think I don't know if uh, Paul's book has to relate to the volume. It's it's a complete it's a different subject because Paul's talking about the Holocaust that went on and he uses the word Holocaust. Right. And he was criticized for that. But um, of the genocide, if you want, um, during the Spanish Civil War that he wasn't he didn't want to just want to win the Spanish Civil War. He wanted to eliminate all Spanish Republicans or leftists or anyone to the left of center or to the left or the right uh, from Spain. So he they went above and beyond just winning the battles to eliminate people in the background in the or in the um, rear guard, sorry. So, I mean, that's, Franco started, you could, you could argue that Franco started before uh, the German concentration camp or about the same time. Well, Dachau started in 32, right, 33, but. Anyway, I, I agree with Paul. <laughs> um, on, the, the book is very complete about what uh, Franco did during the Spanish Civil War behind the lines. So that's my two cents. I would say that, um, that this subject is something that Sarah and I grappled with and debated over years. And um, I think that... Uh, Uh, the, the chapter in our book that I think best addresses the employment of the notion of a Holocaust and how it's been mapped on to um, hot war and state-sponsored terror during the Spanish Civil War in the early years of the Franco regime is very well addressed in the epilogue of our book. Uh, by Nathan Snyder and, and Alejandro Ber, who are sociologists who focus precisely on this issue, the way in which the memory, history, iconography, commemorative practices of the extermination of European Jewry um, becomes entangled with or has left as as Josh said so eloquently during his talk its tendrils and fingerprints on um other other moments of of state-sponsored terror against uh left-wing people and communities including in the southern cone 
and against Republicans in the Spanish Civil War during the Franco regime and in exile during World War II. So I would, I would, uh, it's a, it's a very complicated question to answer, um, and and I think that um, both both in the introduction that Sarah and I composed and in the epilogue. Um, the, the topic is is broached with a, with a lot of uh, care and, and consideration. So I invite you all to uh, to read um, to read the bookends of the uh, of our volume. Oh, thank you. Um, I will turn. I think on the next on our list, um, Peter. I think this was alluded at in the beginning of the presentation, but um, Peter Stansky asks a question regarding um, sort of. Franco saving um, Jews during the Holocaust, this kind of question that was talked about early. Peter, if you'd like to ask your question now. Yes, so th thank you very much for this uh, very interesting session. Uh, um, uh, in, in the introduction, uh, uh, and also uh, in quite a few of the articles uh, in, in the book, there's apparently quite a bit of a discussion uh, about what seems to be largely the myth uh, that during the war, uh, Franco uh, saved Jews. But clearly, some Jews were saved by uh, action of Spanish officials. And also, what's fascinating, it seems to me, it's uh, all tied in with uh, 1492 and, and uh, the, the, the complex relationship uh, between Spain and the Sephardic uh, Sephardics. So I wonder if any of the speakers would like to comment on, uh, I gather the myth grew up in order to make Franco look better, excuse me, <clears throat> after the war. But it would be interesting if if um, any of the speakers would comment on, on the significance, the extent, why it was exaggerated uh, of, of uh, that Jews were, a certain number of Jews were funneled through Spain, got, uh, got off to America, et cetera, and whether, and how many. Uh, I gather it wasn't, a, it, it was a notable number, but, but, but still many more could have been saved. So I wonder if any of the speakers would like to comment on that issue. Thanks very much. Go ahead, Gina. This is you. It's just me. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is this is another topic that um, that Sarah and I worked very hard our, ourselves to understand. It was um, really, I think, especially for me, uh, Sarah's sharper than I am. Um, I didn't understand when we first began the research. Um, the difference, the, the relationship between uh, Sephardic Jews in, in um, North Africa and their relationship, uh, how they were viewed by the Franco regime and the thousands of uh, Ashkenazi Jews who managed to cross um, into so-called neutral Spain during the Spanish Civil War. And we were helped in our efforts by the absolutely brilliant historian who is the it, undoubtedly the world expert on the subject of Jews escaping across um, the border, the, the, the Pyrenees, uh, Josep Calvet. He's a Catalan historian who has written um, uh, quite a few volumes about um, escape routes over over the Catalan Pyrenees. Um, what I would have, what I would, and then what I would say that there's also another very important chapter um, by by uh, a young historian named um, Pedro Correa, who has all who has specifically studied the utility of the myth of Franco as the savior of the Jews. I mean, part of the story is um, rests in 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 the post war. Uh, period leading into, into the Cold War, and that is Franco being seen as a stalwart against um, communism and therefore being elevated um, uh, by the, the former allied powers. Um, 
But Franco had a complicated and uh, Janus faced and highly um, inconsistent policy with regards to Jews who were coming to the borders uh, attempting to cross. Uh, sometimes border guards were acting at their own discretion without, without any direct um, uh, dictates from, from the regime. Uh, they could make their own decisions. Other times, um, Jewish agencies were able to intercede uh, and they, they set up offices in Barcelona and were able to provide help. Uh, the joint was also able to help Jews cross the border. Um, and as the tides of the war shifted, Francoist policy did uh, as well. Um, again, the, 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 the history of, the, uh, of uh, the Jews who crossed um, from France, who came from many different countries, um, is, is explained very well in the works uh, in the ch chapter by Joseph Calvet and also by Mary, in Marion Kaplan's uh, new book, and I'd have to look up the title, but I can put it in the chat, that is about the Jews who crossed through Spain, their experience crossing um, over the border uh, across Northern Spain uh, to Lisbon where boats uh, awaited those who could provide um, the documents and paperwork, very difficult to obtain, visas, uh, proof of, of sea passage that would lead them um, out from Lisbon and, and uh, into, into freedom. Um, Sarah, what do, what do we want to add to that? Just one more name that's really important, and that's Jose Antonio Lisbona. Uh, who, re who wrote an amazing chapter, first publication in English in the volume that deals more specifically with the sort of the lone wolf diplomats who in, in outside of Spain were able to aid Jews um, to obtain the required paperwork to be able to transit through Spain. And again, this was part of the myth that, that Franco sort of absorbed um, the took the credit for these diplomats who actually were working specifically against directives from Spain that had said, you know, had stipulated that no aid should be given to to Jews in Europe. So I also would point you to Lisbona's excellent chapter in our volume that actually details the and names different um, these different uh, diplomats and cultural attaches who were outside of Spain and helped Jews cross um, transit through Spain to, to escape Nazi persecution. Could I, could I add one other thing? Just, I mean, just similar subject, not exactly the same subject, but, but Gina mentioned about uh, Franco's changing policy there. I mean, there were others who tried to get to immigrated across Spain to get to North Africa. And they were French, young French men who wanted to join the free French army. And uh, I mean, in, in 1943, since there was Vichy France, you either head to, headed to the hills and joined the resistance or tried to get to North Africa after the uh, Allied invasion of Casablanca. And so many, uh, there's a subgroup of the Leclerc division called uh, Los Evadidos por España. And so the, the French young men who crossed into Spain were apprehended, sent to the Miranda de Ebro concentration camp for a while. And then when, when Franco had a group of young Frenchmen who were willing to, wanted to get to North Africa, he would sell them for foodstuffs to the French. And then they would get magically get passage to Portugal or to Gibraltar and then cross over, cross over to North Africa and join, join de Gaulle's forces. So it was, it's a small group, but still it, Franco's changing policy during the war changed in many ways. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, this question is has to do with um, Mauthausen itself. Um, this is uh, from Paige Delano on Arthur London. Paige, would you like to ask that question? Uh, hi. Um, actually, uh, my question kind of expanded after I heard Gina's discussion of Robin's book as well. Um, because I've read a fair amount about Robin's book in the French. I've never heard of Spanish women there with them. Um, so, but I was wondering, um, to what extent was there interaction between ideas um, and the Austrian, French, um, Czech, communists, and the uh, um, and the Spanish 
in, in the different camps in Malthus and, and um, Robin's book. Um, in Mauthausen, there was interaction between um, communists from other countries and some of whom were Jews, as you pointed out, Arthur London, okay. um, who, wrote, who wrote the introduction to Montserrat Roche's book. He was one of the people who presented Montserrat Roche's book in Spain and continued to be involved with um, Spanish Mauthausen survivors well, well after into the 70s. Um, there were some limited um, I mean, there, there was quite a bit of interaction because there was what was known as the International Communist uh, Resistance Committee. And so there were Spanish um, communists on that, on that committee, Catalans, and then of course, as you named, Czechs, Poles, French, others who, some of whom were international brigadists and who had fought in Spain and obviously were drawn drawn together um, by their mutual, you know, mutual anti-fascism stemming from, from Spain in the 30s. Um, so that, that there was certainly some interaction in Mauthausen. I don't know, Gina, if you know of more in Ravensbrück. I, you know, in Ravensbrück, I would say that the case is that the Spanish women, first of all, you have this incredible linguistical, linguistical difficulty. And, um, the Spanish and Catalan women understood some French and they tended to be housed near the French and cooperate with the French. But these women were not, Spanish women were not, they may have, they were supporters of the Republic. They had participated in the resistance in France, but they weren't themselves members of the International Brigade. Um, however, as I mentioned in, 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 my, in my brief comments, there was an aura of uh, the cause around around these around these women for having come from Spain and having um, you know having had their uh, you know their their anti-fascist caring card for having uh, fought against um, Franco and then having participated usually in support functions in the French resistance. Um, but they were a tiny group and they tended to be bundled in with 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 French women. Um, both in terms of how they're remembered, also with regard to how they were registered. So we don't, we can never find, I think, um, get a full accounting of all Spanish and Catalan women who were deported to Ravensbrück because so many of them probably entered and then died with their French uh, nom de guerre. Thank, thank you, Gina. Uh, we're coming up on time, so I think we may take one more. Um, I turn it over to uh, Sandra, who is um, a, a in uh, Catalonia and uh, is, has been a participant in the collective trauma restoration projects around historical memory. So if you'd like to ask your, ask your question of the panel, you can go ahead and do so now, Sandra. Thank you, Dennis, and thank you, Gina, Sarah, Bob, and everybody. What I would like just to briefly say is the first time I'm here, but 30 years ago, I work in an event um, with, a, it was a homage for the International Brigades in Barcelona. And that was the first, um, I would say that was the first time that I felt something that I couldn't describe because nobody had told me anything. And I remember Mr. Sosenko and he died being 100 years old. I, I see Bob saying like this, well, that man and that memory uh, was something inside my heart that after 30 years crystallized because to be honest, we have so much collective trauma in this country. I was born in 1974. So I'm a daughter of the silent agreement. Mm -hmm. If it hadn't been for the international brigades, I hadn't made the connection. And I'm so honored, you know, to be here, seeing all of you that come from different parts of the world, because for me, that was always the connection. The help came from outside. Now I'm involved in collective trauma restoration. Um, for three years, I participated in laboratories about the Holocaust and also the impact of war in, in families and communities. And I started that laboratory, those laboratories, First one with the word was like 
finally, I can download something that is not mine. I don't know what it is, but I can make sense. With the Holocaust, my thing was, what am I doing here? I mean, nothing happened in my country. Mm. I just want to say that, okay? Because I didn't know about Montserrat Roch. I'm not a literate. I mean, I was a tour director for 20 years. And I remember my American clients um, giving me books back in 2016 about Spanish civil war. So I, I, I don't know, it's been like, like a long thing. And I owe that to the international brigades, to those men who told me once, uh, we came here not to fight for the Republica, we came here to fight for freedom. And the event was so chaotic 20 years ago and they told me, don't worry, Sandra, this is like the civil war, too much hard, no organization. This is why we lost it. Mm -hmm. So now I'm having shiverings in my body. Like I feel this is strong connection. I had to say that. And I have to say so much thank you to all of you and this book and all of the things that you said, it was straight to the point. I mean, there was nothing that I could say, oh no, it doesn't, it, this is not. So I feel like, how come, again, it comes from outside the help all the time? Of course, here there are things being said. Recently, just to finish, there's been a book that it's called How to Deal with a Dirty uh, Past. It's been published, um, I think, three months ago or something like that. I can send it to you. It's about the collective trauma we have here. It's so, so strong. So, And I'm a Catalan as well, so there is a lot of issues here but again I can't believe how many people from you know other countries are so involved in that and I just had to say it um, feel free to contact me I'm just a normal person I'm a mediator you know and I'm not a scholar like Gina or Bob and Sarah um, but yeah I'm involved in collective trauma things and all that and yeah I'm just here in Spain and thank you Mr. Susenko and all the brigadiers that I met because that was, I ended up in the hospital, by the way, you know, I didn't know, but I ended up in the hospital. It was so strong that event. Now I understand. So just that, I just needed to say, and thank you, Dennis, for giving me voice because I feel it's the past and that strength, by the way, Mr. Susenko was like my grandfather mm -hmm. and I reconnected with my, my grandfather. I didn't know he was a soldier in the Republica because nobody had told me anything. Mm -hmm. And still they tell me why you talk about the history, you know, just leave it behind. And I say, well, because Mr. Susenko and all the brigadiers that came to my country to fight for freedom. So just had to say it. thank you. Thank you, Sandra, what a beautiful, beautiful memory. Thank you for sharing that with us and thank you for, talking with others in Spain and Catalonia about uh, about the brigades. Bob, uh, would you like to add something? Yeah, I wanted to say thank you to Sandra. I was at that. I was part of the organizers for that reunion of international brigades in Madrid and Barcelona. And so I'm glad I we got to some people. That was that was it was very chaotic. Uh, chi how do we say it in English? Gautic, sorry, my French is coming out. It's I'm going to turn into a pumpkin. Um, <laughs> but but um, so yeah, Sand, I'm sorry you ended up in the hospital, but three international brigaders also ended up in the hospital clinic. Then uh, <laughs> too, but anyway, I'll cut it short here. But thank you, thank you, Sandra. Oh, well, thank, again, th yeah, thank you for that statement and uh, for sharing your story there. And I think that's kind of a good way to end that, you know, the importance of historical education um, and kind of recovering this, uh, recovering memory. Um, if you do, uh, did enjoy this, uh, if you did enjoy this workshop and panel, we will hopefully be having a, another Perry Rosenstein cultural series in the upcoming in 2023. Um, with panels and discussions like this, uh, you know, Alba puts on these programs. If you do do choose to make a donation to Alba, you can do so here, and that's also our webpage. You can find out other additional Alba programming. Um, I, again, thank you everybody for sticking with us and coming through, coming here. I don't know if Gina, if you'd like to wrap up or say anything else, but again, thank and thank you to the panel for coming here. Thank. I really appreciate your excellent questions and your uh, attention and your sticking uh, with Alba. Um, 
We invite you to attend further um, workshops like this one. And I'm also the head of ALBA's fundraising committee. So uh, if you enjoyed the program, I really would appreciate um, a donation um, in memory of a, of a vet or of a, a, a meaningful experience you had um, with one of our programs or with um, a cultural encounter that made you think about the importance of fighting fascism uh, then and now. It's through your donations that we're able to continue to have programming like this and to do what's perhaps our most important work, which is teaching high school teachers in the United States about the history of anti-fascism in the United States and the Abraham Lincoln Brigade veterans who, who went to Spain um, in the 1930s. This is a history that, as we've been hearing, is often not taught uh, in Spanish school systems uh, and varies according to uh, autonomous region. And the same is true in the United States. So please do think about supporting our educational programming. It's more important now uh, than ever. And, um, and please stay tuned for further programming. Uh, we have a lot of exciting um, workshops, uh, speaker series uh, on the docket. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a great rest of your day. Okay, good night.